Uh, praise God, beloved people. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Jonathan Kajimu. We are privileged again to do a Pelosi's 30. We've been handling quite a number of series on cultivating the spirit of greatness. I can't fail to forget where we started from, uh, looking again at the life of David and the things that God started to do and how God manifested himself and how those things like the Bible says that the things that were written are for time, were written for our learning that through patience and comfort of scriptures we might have hope. Indeed, these things, when you look through, teach and continue to teach us every other day. I tell always ministers that if there is any one person that will ever teach you about ministry, humility, uh, submission, and all these other qualities that should be in a minister is the man David because from the time he's in the bush and how God chooses him, how God elects him, and how the different things, last time we looked at uh, his relationship with Jonathan and how it was a pivotal point uh, of transformation and change that God starts to bring in his life and how God uses that story uh, and that friendship and the relationship that God established between the two of them to the place that it is to propel him into his next destination. And I remember saying a couple of times that in this life, there are people that God will always bring in your life, and these people will be used by him to position you, to place you in the places that he has designated for you in the name of Jesus. Uh, so today we shall take our reading. We are doing the, I think this will be the last part. Uh, by the grace of God, later in the future, I'll handle about the same thing because there is a lot, uh, but I feel the Lord is leading us um, uh, otherwise. Today, I'll probably do the second last part, uh, then probably the other side, I'll do the last part. Praise God. And it is all nice. I would highly recommend, if you're to listen to this sermon, kindly go back and listen to the first that I did and the second that I did. And this third one, it will give you a very good rhythm uh, of what we are talking about because I organized it in a way that it flows through a, a certain rhythm and chronological order. So today we are taking our reading in James chapter 3 and verses 17. And the Bible says, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to bless you for today. The Bible says the interest of your word brings light and gives understanding to the simple. As we speak forth your word, may you minister to our hearts, may you minister to our minds, may you minister and align our consciences to truth in the name of Jesus. May you transform and bring transformation to the hearers in the name that is above every other, every other name. So one of the things that I want to touch today is under the same uh, someone title, Cultivating the Spirit of Greatness. Today I want to talk about wisdom or what I would entitle to call the seven pillars of wisdom. Now, um, of course, all are relate, we all relate wisdom to the man who operated in it and that was, uh, you know, Solomon. And indeed, uh, the Bible says that God gave him wisdom. He asked actually for an understanding heart. But the scriptures tell us that God gave him an understanding heart and a wise heart. So God gave him two. And his wisdom, like the scriptures teach us, the queen, uh, the, the, the queen came to see the wisdom of this man and the scriptures tell us that she was told off because when she looked at how um, she came to listen to the wisdom of Solomon but it wasn't only the wisdom that he spoke but also in the way things were done because when she gets where Solomon was she says indeed I was told a part of the things I was told a half because she, she begins to see the manifestation of the wisdom from the way the servants were dressed, from the way the protocol team was organized, from the way all these things were done in the kingdom. And she says, oh, indeed I was told a half of it. And when Jesus Christ comes in the New Testament, he says, oh, 
uh, 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 the, the scriptures teach us and say that even though Solomon was wise, but one with greater wisdom is come. And indeed that man, Jesus Christ, sits in us, resides in us. The Bible says that the mystery that was hidden from ages past and now revealed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ Jesus resides on the inside of us and we live, the Bible says in him, we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. So that means that Christ, one with greater wisdom that is residing on the inside of us, by that fact makes us wise. Praise the Lord. Uh, because uh, we, we, to him is righteousness, mm -hmm. wisdom, and redemption. So we are, you are born in wisdom. When you are born again, you are born in wisdom. Praise God. So everyone has wisdom. And when the Bible says that if you lack wisdom, actually the transliteration would be that if you need an addition of wisdom, ask God who gives liberally. So it doesn't mean that the word lack there doesn't mean that you totally lack wisdom, but it means if you need an addition of wisdom, God gives generously to those that ask. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So. James chapter 3 verse 17 introduces us to what we call the seven pillars of wisdom. And uh, I think I'll begin with the first, and the scripture again reads, I would read, the Bible says that but the wisdom that is from above, meaning there is a wisdom of this world, but also there is a wisdom that is from above. This world has wisdom. Our grandparents have wisdom in the things they say and speak. You know they have wisdom, but there is a wisdom of this world, like the Bible says that that wisdom is brought to nothing, but there is also a wisdom that is from above. It is not from high, it is from above. There is a wisdom that comes from God, and that wisdom that comes from God, the Bible says, is firstly pure. Praise the Lord. It's firstly pure, then it is peaceable, it is gentle, it is easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That means that if you are working with a man who has gotten the wisdom that is from above, these are the, these are the multifaceted things that you'll begin to see as you relate with that man. But also, as you are relating with the Spirit of God, it is the Spirit of wisdom that the, the Holy Spirit is multifaceted in all the pillars, in all the seven pillars of wisdom. And that is, the Bible says, firstly, pure. Now, if God is to relate with any man, and if God is to be moved by any man, you realize that God is easily attracted by pure hearts. The Bible says that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, that is Matthew 5, 8. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Men and women that will ever see God move and manifest in their lives are men with pure hearts. You remember the scripture that says they, went, they came to pray and one rich man stood and said, Oh, you know, I give to the poor. Oh, you know, I am blessed. And the other man stood from afar and he said, Lord, I am a sinner. The purity in heart for that man to recognize that, hey, I think I, I have a problem and I need help. That was the purity in heart and he attracted the attention of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember the woman who gave, who gave, who gave a button off her, you know, her shirt and she gave it to the Lord and the Bible says that she has given her best. It wasn't, th th that's all she had and there was a purity in heart that she expressed when she did that. So God is always attracted by people who are pure in heart. Even the spirit of revelation, like many people mention, and say, oh, I want the spirit of revelation to operate and work in my life. The spirit of revelation relates easily with men who have been established, who, who have and who have been established in a pure heart. Your conscience must be pure. It must be purged to, to the truth. There are people who say, oh, I want to be used by God. I want to, to move in the anointing. I want to move in all these things. People who move in the gift can easily be corrupted. Praise the Lord. But a man who moves in the purity of, of heart in his relationship with God, that man can do exploits beyond a man who moves in a gifting. Because a man who moves in a gifting can be corrupted. Their hearts can be corrupted, but a man who moves in the purity of heart and conscience toward God 
that man cannot be corrupted. That's why the Bible says in Philippians, I think chapter it should be chapter one verses nine that uh, I Paul, Paul said that I endeavor to 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 live a life void of offense toward man and toward God. And that the beginning place of all that is that a man has exercised uh, has exercised their hearts, they have fully yielded their hearts to the word of truth so that they don't have to live in offense toward God and toward man. It literally means that they have given out their hearts and God has touched their hearts so that they don't have to live a life that is full of offense. They, Paul says that I live a life void. I, I don't want to ever live in offense toward man or toward God. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And that starts because you have yielded your heart uh, not to be corrupted. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that do not sow your vineyard with diverse seeds. And vineyard is the place of your heart. It is your heart. Do not sow your heart. Do not allow seeds, various seeds, diversity of seeds to be sown in your heart. I always tell people that even though you can learn from, even though you have a hundred teachers, but not everyone can teach you. You can have a thousand people, but you do not learn from everyone. The Bible says, uh, thus so we have not learned Christ. We have not so learned Christ like that. We are there are people that God has ordained to teach you, and it is very important if you ever find those people to sit down and take notes to, 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 to the best of your ability to learn and sit and, and just submit and learn from them. But you are not called to learn from every pastor. Not every pastor that is on TV is actually your pastor. Not every, even when we're growing up, our parents used to restrict us eating from other homes. Locally, we used to call it so you, you don't eat from every home, you eat from particular homes. And the day you understand that, you'll actually have a belonging in the name of Jesus. So the period of heart is very important uh, if you ever want to move in the spirit of wisdom or if you want to move in the spirit of wisdom because that's what he brings to you. The Bible says that but the, but the wisdom that is from above is firstly pure. There is a purity with this, with this wisdom. That's why we do not put a charge on the gospel. Why? Because the wisdom that is from above is pure. There is a purity of conscience and heart that this wisdom brings. And for that reason, we cannot just, you know, engage ourselves in certain things that, 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 that bleach, that, uh, that offend, that grieve the spirit of wisdom. Then, uh, I think I'll under two, he says... Uh, but the wisdom that is from above is firstly pure. Then he says, it is peaceable. Praise God. When this wisdom comes on you, there is peace in all your borders. There is peace all around you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 24, that Solomon had peace on all his sides round about him. And when God was giving David Solomon, he said that he will be a man of peace. He will be a man of peace. That's, that was the promise of God. Why? Because he knew that this man, uh, Solomon, who figuratively represents wisdom, he is going to be a man of peace. Because the wisdom that is from above is firstly pure, second, peaceable. There must be peace. If you operate in the spirit of wisdom, there must be peace. You can't be a man of war. Praise God. You cannot be a man of war. So when you look at Solomon, you realize that he was a wise man. And this wisdom is demonstrated throughout all Israel, throughout all the period that he was, uh, you know, a king of Israel. There was a spirit of wisdom that was operating on him. Hallelujah. So in this life, you will have people that will bring trouble on your door. You will have people that will open up, war. I have, you know, lived in ministries and someone just wakes up and they put a word on you and you have no part in it, you have no place in it and a brother or a sister you know just wakes up and they put this word on you. Some people will open war and today it is actually different than it was in the past. Today people open war on social media. Someone will just post on their status attacking you uh, and you know how the devil has also used that 
uh, that part to destroy and character assassinate many people uh, are speaking to someone and he was telling me oh you see I left this place but this person has kept on saying A, B, C, D, so even though I've kept quiet, it looks as though I'm actually uh, guilty of whatever he's saying, and people will open up a war. And understand it's never them. If somebody ever opens up a war on you, it was actually the devil at work in them. It wasn't, it wasn't them. That's why Jesus says that forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Because the devil had orchestrated all these things and he was working through them to destroy the life of Jesus Christ. So even in this life, the devil will raise many things at, at your disadvantage. Many things will come that are contrary and against you, like the scriptures say, but never allow yourself to, 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 to yield to that kind of attack. So you realize that men will bring war to your door men will bring, your, will bring war on your gates. Some will even, uh, you know, bring uh, attacks on your ministry. I've seen ministries that have attacked. We've also been attacked. We've had our share. And I can't say that that is the end of it. Of course, the more we grow, the more there are attacks. So many things continue to come. There are attacks that can come on your health. You know, there are attacks that can come on your career. There are attacks that can come on your marriage. And you're like, why did I even enter this thing in the first place? Oh, I wish I knew I would not have entered into this deal. Oh, I wish I knew. There are attacks that keep coming on, on, on at different levels of, of life. But as... As, as men that are born again, uh, and I love the fact that the Amplified Bible says we are born from above. Praise God. As people that are born from above, we ought to seek peace. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 14, that pursue peace with all men. It could be expensive. At times it even looks to be foolish to seek peace with people that you know will never change. But you know that's what the Bible has called us to do. There are people in this world who are terribly wicked. But the Bible has called us to live in peace with all men. It doesn't say we should have their contacts or even bring them in our banquets or even call them on our weddings and ceremonies and birthday parties. But the Bible has called us to live in peace. Praise God. Living in peace means that even though they do all these things against you, you will have a period of conscience to say, I choose to forgive and I choose to move on. It doesn't mean that you will go and bless them and, and you know, buy them wonderful gifts, but it means that you, what the devil that is at work in them has not taken a place in your heart. Because when someone hates you and you hate them back, it means you have yielded to the devil that is at work in them. And the same devil now is getting a place in your heart. But when someone hates you and you refuse to hate back, when someone, that's why Jesus says that if you are slapped on the right cheek, turn the left, the, the, the other cheek. It didn't mean to say that give yourself to be beaten by people. But it's, it, it, it's a point of peace. It is a place of peace that we ought to seek with all men. That even though, you know, someone can do all funny things against you, post you on their status, you know, do all these uh, funny, foolish, silly things, you have a place of not repaying evil for evil. That was in the law, and we are no longer under the law. We are under grace. Praise God. It means that when someone slaps you on the right cheek, you will turn the left. Turning the left means you are seeking peace. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. But there are people who abuse them. They say, I will also abuse them too. There are people who attack and they'll say, I also have a mouth I will attack too. There are people who say, oh, if you kill by the sword, you will die by the sword. If you establish yourself under that principle, it will surely work on you. The Bible says that vengeance is of the Lord. There is a God who judges and his judgment is righteous. If people have attacked you and you're truly innocent, then seek your place with God and pursue peace with all men. Praise the Lord. Have nothing to do with them. Have nothing to answer back. Have nothing. Because at times it's even harder to hold back when you have more strength. You know, it is very hard for a boxer to be beaten by a 17-year-old. Then they can't punch them. They can punch them back and they die immediately. 
but knowing that you have too much power to destroy and you refuse to destroy is in itself strength. Strength of a believer is not in punching back, it is in holding back even when you know I can just speak one word and that person will be destroyed. And you say, even though I have the power and the strength and the influence, I can just make one call and this person's life is gone. I choose not to do so. That is strength. You are weak when you fight back. Some people think that fighting back is strength. No. When you fight back, you are weak. When you fight back, you are too small. Praise the Lord. But holding back when you know you have something to say, holding back when you know you have the strength to say something is in itself strength and what a strength. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, the Bible tells us to pursue peace with all men. Don't be quick to fight back. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Pray and forgive for those that persecute you. Pray and forgive for those that persecute you because if you desire to live a godly life, you shall suffer persecution. So pray for those that fight you. Have a place of reconciliation. It may not be to a lasting friendship, but at times, it is what the scriptures have commanded us to do. It's not what we feel in our hearts. It's what the Bible says, and we ought to do that with all our ability. Let's go to, uh, I think, three. So we, we have handled purity of heart and conscience. We've handled the place of peace. Eh? The Bible says that he shall give you peace on all your borders. And the Bible says the peace that surpasses all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then, uh, the place of gentle. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you read Galatians chapter 5, verses 22, when the Bible speaks about the fruit of the Spirit, actually, some people say that that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. No, it is not so. Praise God. It is the fruit of the human spirit, not the Holy Spirit. The working of God in your life brings these fruits, or what we call fruit. Hallelujah. So Galatians 5 verses 22, the Bible says, but the fruit of the human spirit, eh, so to speak, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he is mentioning about the fruit of the human spirit, he mentions about gentleness. And amazingly, even when you're reading James 3.17, when he's talking about the wisdom that is from above, the third element is, is that that wisdom is gentle. That wisdom is gentle in the way he relates with us. And we ought to carry the same because he has worked in us to a place where we ought to manifest him that we are also gentle in our dealings with men and also gentle in the way we deal with the Holy Spirit. Firstly, the Holy Spirit is gentle in the way he deals with us. He will never impose something on a person that doesn't want it. He will convict you, he will lead you, he will rebuke you, but he doesn't impose himself on a particular individual. He doesn't impose something on you because he believes that if you have read the word and you know you've been equipped in the, in the word, then you ought to move a certain way. So the spirit of, of, of wisdom is gentle. Praise God. Is gentle. Is gentle in the way he handles things uh, of the spirit. He will reveal to you what you need. There are people who say, oh, spirit of God, uh, show me about A, B, C, D. He, he, doesn't, show what, he doesn't show you what you want to, to see. He will show you what he intends that you should see. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, gentle, being gentle means to, to be moderate, to be patient. Oh, my God. How God can be patient with us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit that is from above, is gentle. He's gentle. Now, I don't mean the outside appearance of people appearing gentle, but I mean of the inward experience, like the Bible speaks of Moses and says, he, of course, Moses had a temper issue. You know, he, he eat the rock twice, yet God had told him to eat it once. But the Bible says he was the most humble man. 
Praise the Lord. He was the most humble man. That is the place of being gentle, being humble, you know, being, being moderate, being patient. Hallelujah. Not imposing yourselves, yourself on people. Praise the Lord. You have to be gentle in your dealings with men. Then the, the, the fourth one is easy to be entreated. And uh, uh, that is the place of full of compassion. The Bible says when God um, looked at them, his heart moved with compassion. When God looked at, you know, multitudes, his heart was moved with compassion. His heart was moved with compassion. Why? Because, again, <clears throat> it has so much to do because with the place of feeling pain. The Bible says, for we do not have a high priest who is not touched by the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all things tempted as we are. So Jesus' heart is moved when he sees pain. And that is how we ought to live. I think remember, I remember years ago in 2014, I taught this thing and I helped many of my boys and girls then to be established in the ministry of healing. I told them, look, if God is ever to move you in the ministry of healing, he has to make you feel what those people feel. You get on a pulpit and you're feeling headache, and you think the devil has attacked you. No, God is making you feel what another person is feeling. Several times when I've been praying for people, I feel their pain. Praise the Lord. And consequently, I call, oh, somebody has this, somebody has this. Why? Because I feel it. Hallelujah. And do you know how it works? The moment you pray for them, the same pain leaves your body immediately. That's how Jesus felt when he was carrying our sins on the cross. He felt how you feel when you've just wronged, when you've just moved out of his way. Jesus felt it all. Hallelujah. Jesus felt it all. So um, let's read Luke chapter 10, verses 20. Five, I show you something about the Good Samaritan. The Bible says, and behold, um, from verses 30, yes, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, uh, and fell among thieves, and uh, which stripped him of his raiment, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and he saw him, and passed on by the other side. So the first person who came was a priest. Praise God, a pastor, a man of God, a woman, a bishop, is, is the one who passed. Likewise, a Levite when he was at a place, came and looked on him, passed by on the other side. Then we see, verses 33 says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, the Bible says, he had compassion on him. When he saw him, when the Samaritan saw him, he had compassion. And you can't fail to think how many businesses have been established out, out of only this one scripture, the Good Samaritan. Even when pe people come out today and help other people, they say a Good Samaritan came. They don't say a good Jew. They don't say a good priest. They don't say a good Levite. They say a Good Samaritan. Because understand that when this man was coming from Jerusalem to Jericho, maybe, just maybe, he was a Jew. But a Samaritan sees him you remember the war that was between the Samaritans and the Jews to a place that they couldn't even share water? The, the woman who meets Jesus at the well and she says, oh, you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. How can I give you water? The, 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 the difference in race caused them to get to that hard place where they couldn't even share water. But we see another Samaritan here who helps the man, and the scriptures tells, tells us that he had compassion on him. That is the wisdom, one of the, of the distinctive characteristics of the wisdom that is from above, that it is, it is full. It is easy to be entreated. It is full of compassion. There has to be a place where you feel pain. There are people whose hearts are not touched. The place in them that should yield to pain and see other people in pain and want to deliver them, that place in them is dead. Somebody can see you fall down and he says, yeah, you deserve it. Raise up immediately. They can't have compassion on you. 
Hallelujah. Praise God. So the scriptures continue to teach us, and he went, the Bible says, and went into him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the other day when he departed, he took out two uh, pains and gave them to the host and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Jesus, in verses 36, he says, Which now of these three thinketh thou was a neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Praise God, the good Samaritan, the man who, who helped him and paid for his bills. He did not only deliver him when thieves had beaten him and left him, but he actually got him and took him to a place where he knows he can receive treatment. And he told the person, whatever you spend, I will actually pay more. He was willing to do and go an extra mile for a man he had no clue about, for a man he had no relationship with, to make sure that he's healed. Some people only help people from their family. When you look at people, they pay for school fees, they are only their relatives. Praise God. But the scriptures teach us to reach out to even those that we do not know. Hallelujah. So let's go to the... Uh, to, to the next that, that, that says full of mercy and good fruits hallelujah full of mercy and good fruits mercy is the place of holding back even when judgment is due and the bible says the wisdom that is from above is full of mercy and good fruits praise the lord and we know that good fruits of course spring from the heart a man or a woman of god who operates in the spirit of wisdom these things are so distinct, are so one with them that they are full of mercy and they carry good fruits. The place of being wholehearted towards something, the, straight of, the, the place of being straight forward. Hallelujah. It teaches us not to send down curses on people that God died for. You know, there are people who would want to see people die and perish. Because they said it. Hallelujah. Me, don't joke with me. I am a prophet. I'll say one word on you and you'll be gone. Okay, yeah, you can say one word and they'll be gone and that is true. But what testimony have you established? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the law was written and engraved on stones and it was a ministry of death. But the ministry of Jesus Christ is a ministry of life. Where is life if you are? priding in killing people. I, I am, I've remembered a story, I was young, uh, where I grew up in Bunga. So just across where we lived, there was a bunch of believers. Now, I think they had, they had preached to someone to receive Jesus, and this person refused to receive Jesus. And they told him, in three days you will, you, you are going to die. And the person died. Now, young as I was, I praised them for their power. They told someone, you're going. of course, persecution came on them. The village wanted to beat them up to death. Uh, but somehow police helped them to survive. But when I grow up in Christianity, I realized, oh, this was error. This was wrong. Because their act of killing another man of putting a sentence of three days, and indeed after three days the man dies, didn't win any soul. There wasn't glory to it. Because it would have been that if they had told this man that you're going to die three days from now, souls are going to be one. But look, this man too, whom they put a judgment on and he died, I believe he wasn't born again. And consequently, I believe he went to hell. So which testimony they establish? Praise the Lord. Which testimony they establish? I, I wish they used that power to pray for the sick. I wish they used that power to reach out to the lost. I wish they used that power to, to pray for young girls and boys that never had an identity, that looked for a father, for a mother in their lives. I wish they used that power to make wealth and pay fees for children that are not going to school. I wish they used that power for many other things. But they used that power to kill a life. Hallelujah. They use that power to kill a life. So God has called us to be people because we operate in the spirit of wisdom to be men of 
mercy, men that will hold back even when it proves that we can't hold back in the name of Jesus. Then he says, without partiality, eh, without partiality, without partiality, being impartial, praise the Lord, we ought not to show sides. We ought not to side with the wrongdoers. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 1 and uh, Psalms chapter 1 and verses 1. Let's go there. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. God has not called us to take sides with scorners. Praise God. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, is in, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his, not its, his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Praise God. And whatsoever he doeth, he shall prosper. And whatsoever he doeth, he shall prosper. But what is the commandment? The commandment is that do not take sides. Do not even sit. Oh, you know me, I was just seated there. I was not saying anything when they were talking about you. But look, you were seated with them. And when the reward comes for the scorners, you partake of the scorners' reward. Hallelujah. So you're not even supposed to sit. The Bible says, blessed is the man that walketh not. You're not even supposed to walk with them. With the ungodly, not standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Sitting in the seat of scornful is just sitting to watch. You have taken part. That's what the Bible says. But the Bible says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law that he may take day and night. Praise the Lord. And I think we'll, I'll, I'll finish with the last one that says, without hypocrisy. And the message version says, it is not too fast. There are people who in this life who are too Fist. Praise God. They're, they're, the, the, the Bible says they contradict themselves. Uh, it, it, they, they carry two faces. Hallelujah. God has not called us to move and walk in hypocrisy. He has actually called us to have one face. There are people who are touched and they say, hey, you, I'll show you my true colors. Okay, you have multiple colors. I actually thought you only have one color, which is love. Praise the Lord. Why do you boast of other colors which are which are not colors of God. Of course, you know that multifaceted colors means I'll show you how evil I am. I'll show you how wicked I am. You touch me, you will see. I'll take you to prison. That is not of God. We only have one color, and that color is love. In the name of Jesus, we are not supposed to have two faces. That is bipolar in, 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 in psychology, and it's a problem. Praise the Lord. Bipolar, having two personalities. Praise the Lord. God has called us to be one, to be the same person. When money increases, be the same person. You know, I, I, have, I know someone, the moment money increased and they bought for themselves uh, like a simple cow, 14 millions, 15 millions, really. They started to feel important because they have a car. That is hypocrisy. You're an hypocrite because God has blessed you. The blessing of the Lord should not change your character. It, should, it shouldn't change your, your person. You should go down and buy cassava and say, I want cassava for 500. And you know, it doesn't rob anything of you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. You stay humble and stay relating with people. There are people who have gotten positions, you know, in government or in workplaces and because they are promoted or they don't want to talk with particular kinds of people because God has elevated them. Oh, Jesus was called... A, a, a sinner because he used to sit with publicans. He was called a man who eats too much because he looked for the sinners and he would win them to the kingdom. However much God will exalt you, do not carry hypocrisy in your heart to say that you can't associate with a particular group of people. Because at times, you know, I, I look at pastors who have bodyguards and I'm like, okay, so are the bodyguards guarding you from the people God has called you to preach and minister to? Jesus moved with 5,000 people just moving, praise the Lord. And nothing changed about him. He was the son of God. Your anointing can't reduce when you associate with men. No, it can't. It can never reduce. 
it actually increases. Why? Because you are fulfilling the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, seeking the lost and saving them and bringing to them to the kingdom. Depopulating one place and populating the other. And what do we depopulate? We depopulate heaven to populate heaven in the name of Jesus. I trust this blessing has, uh, you know, uh, blessed you. What a wonderful opportunity to serve. Uh, let's pray as we end this. If you're there and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, say these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive you in my life as my personal Lord and Savior. I am born again. If you've just said that prayer, look for us on our social media platforms. Someone is available to attend to you. If you don't have, you know, those mediums, then look for a Bible, believing in and practicing church, and I am quite persuaded they will establish you, they will build you, and they will place you where God has ordained you to be in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, uh, we love you and bye.